in relationship with you and to have eternal life. And we just thank you for that. And we thank you for Jesus and for the blood that he shed. And by your blood, God, we have access. We have a relationship. We have redemption. We have everything that we need, God. And we just bless you and we just exalt you for your great plan. We just thank you, God, that your thoughts are so high. They're, they're so amazing. And that you've allowed us to have your word to look into that we can draw from your word and learn from it and not only just about things that are going to happen but God that we would learn about you and we pray Holy Spirit that you would open our eyes to see you that you would open our he ears to hear what you are saying to us your church God that you would reveal your mysteries and wonders that you would show us your light that you would shine the light of Jesus into our hearts that we would be the life that we would have the life of Jesus and that we would shine it to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. <coughs> All right, everyone, so we are on chapter five in the book today. And for next week, when we do chapter six, we're going to have to read the second half of Daniel chapter seven. Today we're doing Daniel chapter seven, the first half. Next week, we're going to do Daniel chapter 7. Actually, let me tell you right away where it is, where our cutoff is. Um, today, we'll be doing Daniel chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. And next week, we'll be doing Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 onwards. So if you wanted to read ahead for next week, that's Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 onwards. Now, today, let's just start the slide. So we are, we're Everybody's had a holiday. They've forgotten what happened. So let's just see. Uh, that's the book with the fill in the blanks. Those are the videos. I do encourage everyone, if you've missed a class, at this point, please go back and look at the videos because you'll come in starting today. Everything starts to kind of grow, like explode exponentially. All the information just starts to explode. So if you miss a class, please go back, uh, look at the lessons. I have these uh, QR codes outside. I also post the videos on Facebook because it gets a little difficult, you know, if you miss a week or two and then you come in and you're like, what on earth is she talking about, right? So we don't want you to be le like stuck and wondering what I'm talking about. So this is today's ch chapter, lions and leopards and bears, oh my, that's like uh, Wizard of Oz, right? Lions and tigers and bears. So we've been studying uh, the timeline of the statue and we discussed gold was the head of Babylon, the head of Babylon, the head of gold was the kingdom of Babylon, silver, the silver chest and the two arms was Medo-Persia, right? The two arms showed two kingdoms and then we had bronze, which was Greece that was led by Alexander. And oh, if you remember, we did the two arms of Medo-Persia. That was Cyrus and Darius. Those are two kings we talked about. We had the Roman Empire. That was the legs of iron. And then we had the feet of iron and clay. That's the latter Roman Empire. So this is the one that's passed, you know, in Jesus' time. And the latter Roman Empire is the one that's to come. And why latter Roman Empire, you know, is it suddenly a Caesar going to show up? Uh, it's just that the Roman influence is like in every country of the world we're so influenced by it the way we rule our countries um, they've just had such an impact um, so it's called the latter Roman Empire it'll extend all the way to the end till the rock strikes the feet and if you remember there were ten toes right ten toes they're important in today's lesson so this is the timeline and we called it the times of the Gentiles and it's all a time from Nebuchadnezzar's rule all the way to the time of the Ten Toes. And it depicts a rulership uh, when Israel is ruled by a Gentile nation. Okay, It's human government. It symbolizes human government. Now, we talked about the stone being Christ. It strikes the statue. The statue powders and the dust is blown away. There's no trace of it. There's no trace of human government anymore. From that time on, Christ rules in his millennial kingdom and then on forevermore. And so today we're gonna see a little more. So with every vision, a little more information is revealed, okay? So this vision, if you remember, was given to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel interpreted. But today we're gonna see a little more. In a different way, God is showing Daniel a little more. And if you remember, this is a picture from the lesson before. This was, um, Let's go back a bit. 
Remember the head of gold? There was King Nebuchadnezzar and we did King Belshazzar, right? King Nebuchadnezzar was like the glorious king of Babylon and King Belshazzar is the one who saw the writing on the wall and it was implying your kingdom is coming to an end. It will be divided, right? It was mene, mene, tekel, uparsin. That means your kingdom will be divided and it will be basically like split up and given to these two kingdoms, which was the Medes and the Persians. Okay, and we saw that happen. So Belshazzar's transition was going from the head of gold, the head of gold to the silver kingdom, where there was Medo, Persia, Cyrus, and Darius, the other way around, Darius and Cyrus, uh, they rule together. And let's keep going, just to, to remind you. And not to forget the story, remember, of Nebuchadnezzar, he was the tree, right? And he became too proud, God, you know, he got cut down and then he got restored. So don't forget that story. So this is where we, the picture that we saw like a couple of classes ago, this is just for those who can't see vertical, I'll just put it horizontal. Okay, the statue was vertical. This is going a timeline that's horizontal. The statue, these are the kingdoms in the order, right? The order is pretty important. Why I'm doing a review is because today we're seeing a completely different vision, but it's going to be the same thing. It's just a different way of uh, seeing it. So we had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the kings were Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Cyrus, and Darius, Alexander the Great, and then we had the Caesars, and Christ will be the king of the millennial kingdom. And here's the times of the Gentiles. It started when Zedekiah was captured and taken to Babylon. It ends with the second coming of Christ. He is the stone that comes and strikes the statue. Now, this is stuff we've done before, just a refresher. It's important So in today's lesson. So let's look at Daniel chapter 7, Verse 1. I'm going to read it from the Amplified, uh, the Ampl classic Amplified uh, Bible. Certain parts of it. So in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream with visions, blank one is visions, in his mind as he was lying in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and here is the summary of his account. Now remember, we're talking about spiritual dreams again. You have them, and then you wake up, and you know it's God because it leaves an impression on your heart that just doesn't go away. Uh, it just sometimes gets clearer and clearer, and God's trying to speak to you. So Daniel had this vision, and then he got up, and he wrote it down. Okay, so I'm going to read. So your blanks are vision and mind. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Now, when they refer to the great sea, it's like the Mediterranean Sea. You know, Israel was along, is, al is along the Mediterranean Sea, so that they refer to as the great sea. But what I'm going to read um, is from the Amplified, the same thing. Daniel said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens, Political, in brackets, political and social agitations were stirring up the great sea, bracket, the nations of the world. So they're saying the four winds, four winds of heaven, so it's like blowing. So that they're saying the four winds represent political agitations and social agitations. Now, what does that refer to? So remember, when one kingdom takes over, like all kinds of stuff gets stirred up. Like we know when we have an election here, everything gets stirred up, right? So this is not even democracy, it's one kingdom just overthrowing another one. It's pretty turbulent. So that's the wind blowing, and the wind is stirring up the great sea, and the great sea refers to the nations of the world. We're gonna see that a lot. Whenever you see in Revelation and in Daniel, a reference to the sea, it talks about nations, like a multitude of nations is symbolized by the sea. So they're showing these political, this, not disturbances, like changes are happening, and so the, the nations of the world are changing because these kingdoms have such an impact. Because Babylon, if you look at it, went from one end of the map to the other, uh, you know, which was not, not from east to west, I mean, not from all the way to the end because the Americas weren't discovered. It was the known world. It was like the place, the happening place in the known world. Babylon had it. Then they got wiped out and Medo-Persia took over that area. 
they got wiped out and Greece took over, right? And it was like they just conquered larger and larger areas. So it was just, this is the reference that Daniel has. Let's keep reading. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Blank three is beasts. And then I like the way they have it in the Amplified. It says, four great beasts came out of the sea in succession and different from one another. So it's not like all four of them emerged together. They came out one after the other. Okay. Now, when I first read this, I was like, what on earth? Is happening. Let's see what happens next. So he sees four beasts. Let's see what he sees. The first, verse four, the Babylonian Empire, we'll just read it a bit and then we'll talk about it. Actually, the, the first was like a lion but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. Suddenly, another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. While I was watching, another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads and was given authority to rule. While I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before it and it had ten horns. So here's the description of the four animals that he sees coming out one after the other. So the first was the lion, then we had the bear, then the leopard and the fourth beast. Now. The interesting thing is that with these three, he could kind of, comp they weren't exactly a perfect lion, right? It was a lion with wings, it was a bear. You know, they had unusual characteristics. It was just not like a normal animal. But he was like, this one kind of looked like a lion. That one kind of looked like a bear with, you know, this one looked like a leopard, but it had four heads and four wings. You know, they're strange. They all have a certain strange element about it. And then, But the fourth beast, he's like, I have nothing to describe it. Okay, and so we'll see, it's a little unusual and we'll look in detail and we'll see like why is God giving him this vision? I mean, I would read these and I'd be like, what on earth is happening? Like why are we looking at the zoo? What has this got to do with me? Why is this bear eating barbecue? What, do, what has it got to do with me, right? It has three ribs in its mouth, like why? What does it even mean? So let's look at it in detail. Actually what God is showing him is four kingdoms. He's showing him the same idea of the four kingdoms, but this time he's kind of zooming in a little bit and showing him a few more details. So remember, this book of Daniel is all about zooming out and zooming in, zooming out, zooming in. So we saw, remember, we zoomed in and we saw Babylon, the head of gold. We saw Belshazzar, the transitioning of the kingdom. So today, we're kind of looking at it in a different way, but as we look at each animal, it reveals, it's zooming into one kingdom and it's showing a little more that was not revealed in the statue vision. So God is adding information, okay? So it, there may be different elements, right? I never knew that these two visions actually coincide. You can actually line them up and they're both the same idea. I never knew they were connected. Um, there, so like the statue has all metals and this one is all like animals. And if you remember the metals, they were decreasing in value, right? But they were more intense. Like gold is, is malleable, it's like softer, but as you get harder and harder, right, it, the iron's pretty hard. Uh, the same way with these animals, right? They're kind of, the lion is like majestic, but the bear's kind of sloppy you know, and, and things are changing. The majesty is being lost as we go along, but it's getting more and more fierce as the animals go in. And they're just implying things about the kingdom. And we'll look at it and we'll see what's changing. So the kingdoms are decreasing in superiority, but they're increasing with fierceness, with cruelty as they go along. 
So like Babylon, right? Nebuchadnezzar was supposed to be a very good king. He was, you know, he conquered the world and everything, but he had this glorious kingdom and they were kind of good to the people that they captured. Um, the Medes and the Persians were also pretty good. Remember, under Cyrus, he let the people go back and rebuild their kingdom. But then you had the Greeks who were a little more fierce. They had all these weapons. And then you had the Romans who were so horrible, they ruled like with this band of iron. They crushed people by uh, suppressing any riots. And then they crucified people, right, in Jesus' time. That's how they controlled people, through fear and cruelty. So the, the kingdoms are decreasing in, in glory, but they're increasing in cruelty. Um, so let's keep going. We'll see each one. So different elements, but the same order of events. They're all coming out in the same order. So we look at it. Four beasts emerge in succession. They represent the four main world powers that rule in the same order as the statue metals. Okay? So let's look at it. So we know the statue now, right? We should have this pretty well set up. The Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece... Uh, Roman and Latter Roman to be followed by the millennial. So we know that pretty well. We've, we've seen that a little bit. So now we're going to take a look at the new one and see how it relates to this. So let's look at our books. I'm on page, chap uh, page 30. The Lion. Okay, Daniel chapter 7 verse 4. So let's look at the first animal and see what, what it's all about. Like when you read all of them together, you're like, oh, what is this? So let's look at number one. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. Blank four is eagles. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. Torn is blank five. It was lifted up from the ground, set on its feet like a man, and given a human mind. So it's full of symbolism. Your next blank is human. That's blank six. So your blanks are eagles, torn, and human. So there is no such animal, right? There's no lion with eagle's wings and it's made to stand up. And No. So obviously it's not some new animal, but God is using symbolism to get a message across. So we look at the symbols. The lion with eagle's wings actually represents Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, okay? If you remember this picture I showed you, this is actually a segment, I think, of the Ishtar Gate. And I can't, you can't see it very clearly, but it's a lion, and there's actually wings here. And they thought Nebuchadnezzar was like the god, and he descended, and he was represented by a lion. Um, so his wings, the lion with eagle's wings is a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It says, if you remember... The wings were torn off. So wings are like a symbol of power. And so when the wings were torn off, it was that story of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he became very proud. He said, look at Babylon, this great thing that I have done by myself, me, myself. And he forgot about God, and he got cut down. This tree got cut down. So the wings being plucked off is symbolic of that happening, of him being stripped of his power and his sanity. Remember, he lost his mind. Right? And he became an animal and lived for about seven times. <coughs> then, excuse me, when he looked up to God and he acknowledged God, what happened? His mind came back, right? Okay, so that's the next part. He was lifted up from the ground. So it's like lifted up and made to stand upright. So an animal, animals don't stand upright except for bears, right? Lions definitely don't stand upright. So it's an unusual thing. So they're just saying he's being converted from uh, an animal to a man. He's standing upright and he's given a human mind. So his sanity was being restored to him. So this is a reference to that story of Nebuchadnezzar. It's the gold kingdom. It had a couple of kings, but Nebuchadnezzar was the most notable. So that's this symbolism of the lion with the wings is Nebuchadnezzar, and it represents the gold kingdom and the statue. So the head of gold is you, O king, if you remember that. Now let's look at the next beast, the bear. Suddenly another beast appeared. This is verse 5 of Daniel chapter 7. A second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side. Blank seven is side. With three ribs, blank eight is ribs, in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh, 
pretty gory. I mean, like, why? Why did they add the details of the ribs? And mm, it's kind of gross. Um, I was just zapped when I read these initially. So side and ribs. What does it mean? That's the best picture I could find. I think bears are really cute. Not that I've seen one, but yeah, I think they're super cute. But this one is on its side. It's like lopsided. So as in implying that one shoulder is kind of higher than the other. Okay, that's the implication. It's off. It's not even. Okay. So bear eating barbecue, that's the way I remember it. It has three ribs. Who cares whether they're three or seven? What's the implication? Okay. The, and we're going to see. So remember I said how it's lopsided, like one shoulder is slightly higher than the other. It refers to the Medo-Persian kingdom. Remember the two arms? Remember the vision of the statue? It has two arms. But nothing is shown in that statue about it being like one up or one down or the arms being uneven. In the statue, it's like it just says two arms. Now it's adding a little more detail and it's just showing it's the Medo-Persian kingdom depicted by the silver chest and arms. That's your next blank. Blank nine is chest. Blank ten is arms. Okay? But it's slightly lopsided. So it's giving us an insight into this Medo-Persian kingdom. The bear was raised up on one side. It means that one side is more superior to the other. So it represents the superiority, that's your next blank, superiority of the Persians over the Medes. So if you remember, uh, I said like no kingdom was stronger than Babylon. That's why they couldn't conquer. Babylon was like, you know, impenetrable. Nobody could get through. But the Medes and the Persians got together and together they were stronger than Babylon. But here's a little more detail that the Persians were actually stronger. But together, they still needed the might of media to go together. But it's just showing the superiority. Cyrus was greater than Darius, and it was a co-regency. They ruled together. Okay, so that's just a little more detail that's being added. And, you know, why is it important? Because Daniel is actually seeing this vision in the year, first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. He's actually seeing the vision in, like, the head portion, if you're looking at the timeline. He's seeing the vision of things to come, like from the head, and he's seeing details that God is revealing to him. So why is it important? Why does it matter to me? What are we learning about God here? Is that if you stay with him, if you continue to live in him, he has more to show you. He has more to reveal. It's not just, you know, once and it's done. You know, not a one-hit wonder that you have this one experience with God and he's done. No, he's wanting to reveal more and more if we'll just sit at his feet. Why? Because then when we know what his thoughts are, what his mind is, so we can walk in wisdom, okay? We can walk in the fullness that he has for us. Okay, keep going. Three ribs in the bear's mouth. They actually represent the major conquests of these countries. Together, they... They conquered Egypt, which was a massive kingdom, Lydia, and Babylon. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention why this is, this doesn't, excuse me, the animals don't mean anything to us because we're not in that time. But just think in today's world, right? Uh, you know how countries are represented by animals, right? If I said which animal is, I mean, which country is represented by the eagle, all of you know. America. Which one's represented by the dragon? China. Okay, India is the peacock. Yeah, right, we have certain symbolism that's associated with countries. So actually the same thing here. So in that time when they saw these animals, they were like, boom, it's that country. Boom, it's that country. They knew it. It's just us and we're like, what's with all the animals? Right? So it's because we're out of time. <laughs> so let's move on. So they conquered Egypt, Lydia, and Babylon. They were major, major countries. And to get, these were their conquests. So the bear, it's kind of, see, it's more brute, right? It's a brute beast. It's like, it's not magnificent like the lion. It's got ribs and it's kind of gory. So it's, it's just showing you how the kingdoms are kind of declining but becoming more fierce. Verse 6, while I was watching, another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. Wings is your next blank, blank 12. 
It had four heads, blank 13, and was given authority to rule. So wings and heads. Now, what is the connection? Like, what's the point? This is a leopard. What, what are you seeing in this picture? What does this tell you? What is it doing? Speed, yeah? It's a really, really fast animal. The bear is kind of slow and lumbering, right? This one is like fast. It's not even like touching the ground, right, in this picture. It's so fast. So the leopard implies swiftness, okay? But it's got something unusual of the leopard that we're looking at. It has four heads and four wings. So the wings are added. Imagine if a cheetah had wings. It would move even faster, right? So the implication is that this kingdom is like spreading really fast. And if you look at history, right, this is the Greek kingdom, right, Greece. The, the way that it spread, Alexander was this really young guy, but he was so mighty as a king, he just like spread all over the world. He conquered everybody super fast, so much so that what's your New Testament written in? I mean, we have it in English. The original New Testament is written in Greek. Why? Because that was like the prevalent language. It, it went all over the world, and it spread all over the world, and everybody knew Greek. Just like we know English, right? Or there's Mandarin, or just... There are certain languages that fill the world. And Greek was one of those languages. The interesting thing, I find it really interesting, this is a side note, is that that language got frozen. Like, it hasn't... You know, English is constantly changing. If you... If you use some words, you tell your grandfather that word, they'll be like, what does that even mean, right? Uh, you know, it's constantly changing. English is morphing and changing because we're using it uh, in, like, normal everyday language. Greek actually, like, stopped, and it's, like, frozen because then you can still, so that the scriptures are in that language, it's preserved. And I think that's so amazing. So you can learn Greek today and really understand the scriptures. So it's just how God has his hand over all these things, these little details. I think that's fascinating. So we have the leopard. It's a swift animal, and then it has wings to aid its progress. It represents a speed with which Greece or Alexander conquered the world. And you know what happened to Alexander? He died really young of something, some, some very plain and boring disease, nothing great. He wasn't killed in battle. He didn't die of a mighty, you know, some sword plunge through him, nothing mighty. He died of like something like the common cold. I can't remember what it was, but it was really insignificant. And he died a very young man. The bear corresponds to the bronze kingdom. Remember the the bronze, we went beyond the hands, and now we're in the abdomen and thighs. So the bear kingdom corresponds with that portion, which is, which is um, the abdomen and thighs. So that's actually your next blank. 14 and 15, I'm on page 32. Now we have an interesting thing here. What's with the four, right? The statue just had abdomen and thighs. That's all. There was no like details. Now we're going in and God is showing a few more details. Four heads and four wings. What was that? After Alexander died this very, you know, sad death at 30 something, uh, the kingdom was divided. It was a mighty kingdom. It was divided into four and his four generals took over and I'm not going to teach you their names today because <laughs> you'll all freak out. Actually, if you want to look at it later on in the book, I think it's page 49. For the nerds in the room, I think it's page 49. Yes, 49 shows the four divisions of Greece um, and the names of the four generals. Why is it significant? It will be. I'm not throwing facts out at you. It will be for the lessons that we're going to learn. Know that we had four kingdoms that came out of Greece, Egypt, Syria, Thrace, and Macedonia. Okay? Um, important for later. So just know this. Four generals, four kingdoms that came out of Greece. And the fourth beast. Now these things all came true. Whatever we've seen so far has come through like to the day with all the details like so perfect. It's not like we are going back and sticking, you know, facts into the vision. They actually came true that way. Okay. It's, it's just fascinating. Now, now, next verse, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. 
while I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared, frightening, blank 16 is frightening, and dreadful, and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth. Iron is your next blank. Frightening and iron. So he says, he doesn't say like a lion or a bear, right? He just says a fourth beast appeared. Frightening and dreadful, incredibly strong and large teeth. So see how it's more fierce, okay? And it's frightening. He didn't say the lion was frightening. He didn't say anything. He didn't mention all these little details. So what is this animal? Let's keep going. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different. That's your next blank. It was different, blank 18, from all the beasts before it and it had 10 horns. Horns is blank 19. So let's look at this animal. It's indescribable. He doesn't know, he can't compare it to a giraffe or a cat or a dog. He's like, I've never seen anything like it, okay? Um, so that itself kind of leaves you wondering. It's more dreadful than the prior three beasts. It's not as majestic, but it's like, it's, it's, it's dreadful, it's frightening, it's got large iron teeth, it crushes its prey, it tramples under its feet, it's not pretty. Now just to really quickly go through, the head of gold was the lion. I wish I could just like stick them side by side. Head of gold is Babylon, which is the lion. The silver chest and arms is Medo-Persia, which is the bear, the lopsided bear. And then you have the abdomen of bronze, which is Greece. And then you have the legs of iron and clay. Now here, they don't split it into Roman and Latin, Roman. It's just all one that you're seeing. Like for this region, you're seeing this terrible beast is what we're gonna to refer to it as. The terrible beast. The kingdom is represented by a terrible beast. And that's, it's significant. Okay, as in it's getting more and more ferocious as things go, as time proceeds. So that's the Iron Kingdom. The terrible beast is the Iron Kingdom. And remember that it, the legs of iron and the feet had iron in it? Well, this animal had iron teeth. This terrible beast had iron teeth. As in it's a really strong and scary uh, metal. It's very strong. Remember he had 10, the, the fierce animal that we just saw had 10 horns. It corresponds to the 10 toes. You see how it lines up like so beautifully? I never saw this. I, I didn't have the brains to see this. Um, it's just, it's God has his design. If we stop to even look at it, just everything is just, it falls into place so neatly. Um, it can only be God. So what is this about the 10 horns? Now today's lesson, it may seem a little bit vague, but as we progress, it's gonna make so much sense. So if you can get these points, if you can go home maybe over the week and kind of just look at the pictures and remember the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the fierce animal, the beast, the terrible beast, if you can kind of just recap and refresh, sorry, um, and then 10 toes equate to the 10 horns, and now we're gonna see a new character, and that is in Daniel chapter seven, verse eight. While I was considering the horns, we have 10 horns, remember? 10 horns. Suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. So we have 10 horns, and then three, pick three are uprooted, and then a tiny little one comes in its place. Okay? That's what they're saying. There were eyes in the horn, in this horn, like a man's. So we have this tiny little horn which has eyes, okay? And it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Obviously, this is not a real physical animal, but again, it's symbolism. Remember, so we are following the same train of thought. Those animals are actual kingdoms. There's an actual order. There's a timeline. So if the lion was there, the bear was there, the, uh, the, the leopard was there, obviously, this terrible beast is going to be there. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. It's something that's, uh, it's the symbolism of a kingdom that's really going to be there, okay? And um, so what is this horn? The little horn of Daniel is what it's referred to, okay? 
The 10 horns of the terrible beast correspond to the 10 toes. We got that. But in the statue, we only saw 10 toes. No news given to us about it. It just said in the time of the 10 toes, the, the rock strikes the statue. That's all we know. So now a little more detail is given. The 10 horns, that's blank 20, the 10 horns are 10 kings. Okay? This detail is given to us. The 10 horns are 10 kings. But out of those horns came a little horn. Blank 22 is little horn that uprooted three kings. So these are kings that are ruling over this kingdom. Three get taken down, one comes up in its place, and that's called the little horn. The little horn is none other than the Antichrist. Okay, Antichrist, Antichrist, blank 23. He will have dominion over the earth for a while. Now, in the study of end times, he's just being introduced here. In the study of end times, there are so many people that go off the deep end, okay? Because all they're looking for is the Antichrist, okay? God, Jesus says, watch and pray. It's not for the Antichrist. We're watching for Jesus, okay? So it's very important that while you study end times, while you study eschatology, you have to have your eyes fixed on Jesus, right? And everything else, they're all side characters. They all have a part to play. It's all like a chess game and God is in charge. But if you just focus on one, you're going to miss out on the grand plan, okay? So uh, if, you, if you look at uh, studies on Revelation, they're all about, oh, it's like turn and burn. And, but uh, it's actually all about Jesus and his great design. So we have to look at it, stand back, and we are seated in heavy places with Christ Jesus and we're looking down at God's plan. Why? Because when we know he has a plan, we can rest assured that whatever little thing we're going through today, his plan is greater, his plan is bigger. We just have to be cool, right? And be anxious for nothing. I have to keep telling myself this, be anxious for nothing, be anxious for nothing. Because in the end, what we're seeing today is not a reflection of what's going to happen tomorrow or 10 years from now. Because it's only a small part in the plan that God has. So be anxious for nothing. Okay, this is an introduction to the Antichrist. I think that's my last slide. So just to show you, we had 10 toes. We have, there are actually 10 kings. Three of them are replaced. I don't have 10 horns, okay? So I just have 10 toes to reference to. Three horns are going to be replaced, and one little horn comes up, which has eyes and has a mouth. And that's important later on, okay? So just remember that. But his dominion is for a short time. His dominion comes to an end when the stone strikes the statue. Okay, so it's not like he rules forever. Actually, next week's chapter is going to be like really fabulous because that just gives you such a perspective of what's happening from heaven's, from heaven's view. So what I've written in the book is that he has dominion until the courts of heaven decide otherwise. He... The courtroom of heaven is what we're going to study next week and just how it works and how God orchestrates things. It's not just, oh, these things are just happening, oh my gosh, by accident, God's not being caught by surprise. He has a plan, he has a purpose. And that's, go back and study and take a look at it. So now let's fill in the blanks on page 34. I don't have them up here, but let's just look at it. We have the table which has the animals, I have the features, the statue equivalent, and which kingdom it is. So let's fill it in. The lion, what's the unusual features? It has eagle's wings. Blank 24 is eagle's wings. The statue equivalent is the head of gold. Blank 25 is gold. That's the Babylonian kingdom. The next one is the bear. What's the unusual characteristic? The barbecue, right? The three ribs ribs in its mouth. It's actually not barbecue. It's just like a more gory, bloody kind of an image. That was just me being silly. Um, it, it represents the chest and arms of silver. Blank 27 is silver. And that is the Medo-Persian kingdom. Next, we have the leopard with the four wings on the back and four heads. Blank 28 is wings. And that corresponds to the belly and thighs of bronze. 
So that's this bronze area. Bronze is blank 29. And that's the Grecian Empire. The terrible beast with iron teeth. Iron is blank 30. It corresponds to the legs of iron. Okay. That's the Roman kingdom. But also we have the 10 horns. Blank 32 is horns. And the little horn. So the beast kind of takes up this entire thing here from the old Roman Empire to the latter Roman Empire. So we have the horns and the little horn. Ten horns and the little horn. And that is the feet and toes of iron and clay. 34 is iron. 35 is clay. And that corresponds to the latter Roman. Okay. So now you kind of got this. I'd like you to go back and review this some point next week because it'll, it, we're going to just build on this. And like I said, everything's going to explode. And it'll make a whole lot of sense when we look at it. Uh, I just want to go through these questions. What was the point of God showing Daniel all these wild animals? It was a symbolism, but God was showing it to him in a way he could understand. And now doesn't it look simple? Now when you look at it, now I'm like, yeah, that, that's what, Okay. Now I got it. It kind of makes sense. It's not too complicated. But if you put it in that same order, if you realize the visions are connected, it's pretty simple. And how did they relate to the statue? They're all, it's the same thing. It's the same order of events with a little more detail. And why does God repeat the concept? Why does God repeat a concept? Like when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the first time, this is before I got filled with the Spirit of God, uh, I was like, why does he keep repeating himself? This is boring. Right? I also read Acts and thought it was boring. Then I got filled with the spirit and everything just took off. Right? It's not boring. It's like, wow. So he repeats things for a reason. Remember the Pharaoh's dreams? He had them twice. Uh, we had Mene, Mene, Tekel. Remember? He's like, Mene, Mene. He's like, this is going to happen like immediately, like urgently. Uh, when God is trying to get your attention, he repeats things. Okay? It looks a little different. Remember Pharaoh's dreams? It was like seven cows and seven fat cows, seven thin cows, seven fat years and seven thin years of wheat or corn or whatever that was. Uh, it's the same idea, just different pictures. He's trying to convey an urgency. He's trying to get a message across. He's trying to say, hello, get up and listen. That's what he's trying to say. So that's, that's how, but he conveys it in a way that is kind of easy for us to relate to, right? Animals and tigers and stuff. Yeah, we can kind of relate to that. So God is trying to tell you something. God is trying to tell me something. We need to sit up and listen. So here's a modified picture. This picture is only going to get worse, okay, as the days go by. I actually, in our Sunday school class, I used to draw it on the whiteboard. And then someone said, do you have to keep coming earlier and earlier every week to, like, draw more and more and more as it kept growing? I would stand up on a chair, and it was just, like, huge. So I don't know how we're going to fit it into this screen. Uh, but here we go. Statue, times of the Gentiles. It's from here to here. The millennial kingdom extends. This is the lion. That's Babylon, bear, Medo-Persia, leopard is Greece, beast is Rome, and ladder Roman. I didn't have space for the two. Uh, we've just added on what we saw today, right? The stone is Jesus. He strikes the statue. Why is this important? We're going to see something so fascinating next week. It's all about heaven. I used to think Daniel was a bunch of random visions, you know? I used to think, oh, and like next week we're going to learn about the Ancient of Days. And we had songs that sang about the Ancient of Days, and it's fantastic. But I never knew what it meant. I never knew, like, what's the context when actually every vision lines up so beautifully, I'm like blown away. I'm like, that's what it meant. Oh, so that's where this is happening. I'm able to take it and put it in time, put it in position. So I'm very excited about next week. It's, uh, it's going to be very interesting. So hope to see you then. Let's just finish and pray. So remember, next week's lesson is Daniel chapter 7 from verse 9 onwards. We're going to get the context of what we've seen so far. So let's wrap up with prayer. Father God, we just bless you for the simplicity uh, in your word, Lord, and for your revelation, for your Holy Spirit who reveals things to us, God, where we just think things are boring. Without you, this book is poetry, but with you, Lord, it's just fascinating. It's full of wonders and mysteries and how you want to speak to us. Holy Spirit, once more, we ask you, God, to speak to us in dreams and in visions. Show us more 
about who you are. Show us your nature. Show us how mighty you are. Show us how loving and wonderful you are. Help us to understand and perceive your love, God. Help us to understand what you want to do with our lives. Help us to walk in your purpose and your calling and your wisdom, God, and let your light shine in us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.